Hello, it's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 24th of March. You're tuned into our mid morning newscast here on Adi Lang TV. Thanks ever so much for being with us. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at the headlines. Korea and New Zealand formally sign their free trade agreement. Under the deal, both countries will remove tariffs on most of their traded goods over the next 15 years. The United States announces Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will visit the White House and be the guest of honor at a state dinner on April 28th. The Japanese leader is also expected to address U.S. Congress during his week-long trip. Plus, Park Tae-wan, Korea's marine boy and former Olympic swimming champion, has been banned from the sport for 18 months for failing a drug test. But our top story this morning, Korea has completed the signing of its free trade agreement with New Zealand. The FTA, some five and a half years in the making, was finalised on Monday when President Park and hae and visiting New Zealand Prime Minister John Key inked the deal at the presidential office of Chung Wai Day. All that remains is for the FTA, uh, FTA to be ratified by the parliaments of both countries. Our Choi Sun starts us off. President Bakun Hae said Monday's signing of the Korea New Zealand FTA will go down in history as a major event in 53 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. So FTA 정식 서명으로 이제 양국 관계는 경제 분야는 물론이고 문화 또 인적 교류 그 안보 또 국제 협력 이런 다방면에서 한 차원 더 높은 그런 협력을 on his fourth visit to Korea, Prime Minister John Key thanked President Buck for her leadership in resuming trade negotiations after a three-year deadlock. I'm sure that uh, the benefits to Koreans and New Zealanders will be significant over the years ahead, and so this is a very special and beautiful day to be in Seoul. Both countries have agreed to remove tariffs on most of their traded goods in 15 years. However, nearly 200 products categorized as sensitive items for Korea, such as rice, are exempt from the pact. Aside from trade, New Zealand will expand its working holiday quota to 3,000 Koreans a year and share training on its advanced agriculture and fisheries technology. At Monday's talks, the two leaders also discussed ways to integrate initiatives involving creativity and innovation as a new growth engine, agreeing to increase cooperation in science, ICT and film. President Buck said the latest trade deal will give Korea's agriculture sector an opportunity to become more globally competitive by learning from the New Zealand experience. She also anticipated more job opportunities for Koreans both at home and abroad. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. And this latest FTA with New Zealand is Korea's 13th. And while it goes without saying that the deal with Wellington is dwarfed by Seoul's agreements with economic powerhouses like the United States and the European Union, the new free trade deal is going to have a significant impact on the Korean economy. Shin Se-min reports. The latest free trade agreement between Korea and New Zealand is set to increase trade beyond the approximately 3.2 billion U.S. dollars generated last year. Most of the exchange products will have little to no tariffs, with Korea eliminating duties on 96 percent of all shipped goods from New Zealand in the next 15 years, and New Zealand removing all taxes on Korean goods in seven years. Korean exporters shipping small electronic goods, auto parts and heavy equipment will see a boost as these goods will enter the market with low tariffs. And New Zealand's popular imports? Wine, beef and dairy products. The pact will just swap more than just products. It'll also open doors to Korean youth employment in New Zealand and easier exchange of agricultural technologies and expertise. New Zealand's Zespri has already helped Jeju Island kiwi farmers. This year, Jeju Island kiwi made it into the Singaporean market for the first time, contributing to the regional economy. And Korean companies are also making headway into New Zealand with an ICT company that manufactures a smart card for transportation. 
But Koreans in the dairy and livestock industry aren't happy, as New Zealand's strong dairy industry will increase competition in the domestic market. Korea's Rural Economic Institute projected over 2 trillion won, or 1.8 billion U.S. dollars worth of domestic losses. But some experts advise patience. This is part of improving our competitiveness in the long run by giving a wider selection to consumers. Lowering trade barriers is only one part of the FTA's benefits. Although New Zealand isn't a large exporting partner, experts say with the right amount of government regulation and thorough monitoring, the agreement will generate mutual economic benefits. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will make a one-week-long visit to the United States at the end of next month. Officials say Abe will visit the White House and will be the guest of honor at a state dinner on April 28th. The White House says trade and particularly plans to conclude the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, will be the main topic of conversation between U.S. President Barack Obama and Abe. Abe is also expected to become the first Japanese prime minister to ever address a joint session of the U.S. Congress at some point during his trip. If the speech is given the green light, some members of Congress and Korean-American civic groups are pushing to ensure Abe shows some remorse for Japan's past wrongdoings, particularly the Japanese military's sexual enslavement of Asian women, many of whom were Korean during World War II. Now, some well-known faces from Korea's political yesteryear have been in Japan this week on a diplomatic mission to try and repair the frayed relations between the two neighbors. Meeting Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Tokyo on Monday, the Korean delegation said it was high time for a leaders' summit. Our Connie Kim reports. A group of veteran political and economic leaders from South Korea has called on Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to restore strained bilateral ties. They said both Seoul and Tokyo should create conditions for a summit. Abe reportedly responded with a vow to strive for improved relations now and for the future of Japan. Japanese broadcaster NHK, however, said that Abe called for summit talks with no strings attached. The Japanese leader is set to deliver a World War II anniversary statement in August, but there are concerns that he will shift away from an apology issued in the 1995 statement by then-Prime Minister Domichi Murayama regarding Japan's wartime atrocities. Abe has said that he wants his statement to reflect the current government's position on historical issues. Ahead of today's meeting, the South Korean delegation met with Japanese representatives on Sunday to discuss bilateral cooperation as this year marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Relations between Seoul and Tokyo are at a historic low, mainly due to Abe's repeated denial of Japan's historic wrongdoings. The former Korean and Japanese leaders plan on meeting again in May to come up with a proposal for diplomacy that they plan on presenting to both President Park Geun-hye and Prime Minister Abe. Connie Kim, Arirang News. North Korea has once again denied any involvement in the sinking of a South Korean warship five years ago. So, as a result, it feels it has nothing to say sorry about. The North's National Defense Commission said Tuesday that it will not apologize in exchange for the lifting of South Korean sanctions imposed following the torpedo attack on the Chonan back in 2010. The commission called Seoul's demand for an apology, quote, nonsense adding that the sanctions must be removed for the sake of better inter-Korean ties. And that latest statement out of Pyongyang comes just one day after a South Korean activist said he would halt anti-North Korea leaflet launches for good if the regime took responsibility for its attack on the Chonan, that South Korean warship. The activist in question said no apology would result in the floating of the balloons on Thursday as planned. Our Jim Young gil has more. A group of activists led by North Korean defectors have called off plans to fly some half a million anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border this week. But there's a catch. North Korea must apologize for the 2010 sinking of the South Korean Chonan warship, which killed 46 South Korean sailors. If they are so afraid of our anti-Pyongyang leaflets, then they should have apologized for the torpedo attack on the Chonan warship. Then we wouldn't have sent the flyers. 
The activists said they will still send the leaflets and copies of the U.S. film The Interview if Pyongyang ignores their demand. North Korea has condemned the flyers as one of the greatest obstacles to overcoming South-North tensions and has not only threatened attacks but also a halt to family reunions and operations at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex. We've seen in previous cases where North Korea stopped work at the Kaesong Industrial Complex because of anti-Pyongyang leaflets and limited access to the industrial park. The South Korean government says it does not have legal ground to curb such civic activities, but has asked the group to make wise decisions. The issue has raised safety concerns among residents in border regions. Last October, the two Koreas exchanged gunfire after the North attempted to shoot down balloons carrying similar leaflets. While no one was hurt, inter-Korean relations took a major hit and has yet to rebound. Kim Young-gil. Arirang News. Now, the world has been joining Singapore in mourning the death of a legendary leader, Lee Kuan Yew, who oversaw three Lee Kuan Yew, rather, who oversaw three decades of development that transformed the port city-state into a global financial hub. For more on this and the other global headlines we're following this hour, we connect to Eunice Kim at the News Center. So Eunice, Singapore began its week-long period of national mourning and messages of condolence are pouring in. That's right, Mark. And Korea's own foreign minister, Yoon Byung-hae, remembered Lee Kuan Yew as a giant of a man and one of the best friends of Korea when he visited the Singaporean embassy in Seoul on Monday. An endless stream of tributes were made online and off among the many in Singapore, the presidential residence of the Istana. Just outside of it, a group of mourners awaited the arrival of Mr. Lee's body, some calling out his name. This as world leaders have sent their deep condolences, China calling the 91-year-old an influential statesman and strategist, Indonesia remembering him as an inspirational leader in Asia, and Malaysia noted Lee's legacy that will be carried forward with the future of Singapore. He leaves a truly remarkable legacy. All he's done for that country is Unbelievable. But now uh, we understand that President Park and Hay will head to Singapore on Sunday to attend Mr. Lee's state funeral. Uh, tell us what's planned for the week ahead. Sure, that state funeral on Sunday will be the culmination of this period of national mourning, followed by a private cremation of the former prime minister's body. And starting tomorrow, mourners will be able to pay their respects at the parliament building where Mr. Lee's body will lie in state. It'll be there through Saturday leading up to the state funeral. Founding father Lee Kuan Yew, as he is affectionately called, is credited with with leading modern Singapore through independence from Britain, separation from Malaysia, and eventually into the prosperity that is, of course, known today. Yes, it's a wonderful uh, place to go visit as well. And now let's switch over to a new threat, this time directly, squarely at American troops. Yeah, that's right. This is a group claiming to represent the Islamic State Group's hacking division. It's calling on lone wolf jihadists in America to attack some 100 U.S. troops. The group posted online their names as well as their photos and addresses. It also claims to have hacked into military databases to access the information. All of these claims, U.S. authorities, including the FBI, are said to be looking into to a Defense Department spokesperson did say he or she could not immediately confirm the validity of the information. Nonetheless, related service members have been notified and have been advised to stay vigilant. Mark. Yes, worrying development, and let's hope that uh, those U.S. servicemen are safe. Thank you very much, Eunice, as always, and we'll see you back at noon. Sure thing.
The head of the European Central Bank has been whipping up support for the ECB's 1.2 trillion US dollar sovereign bond buying program. Addressing the European Parliament in Brussels on Monday, Mario Draghi said there's solid evidence that the regional economy is already getting a boost from its quantitative easing program, which was announced two months ago. Now, currency markets have responded with the euro hitting an 11-year low against the greenback last Thursday. On rising deflation fears, Draghi forecast the inflation rate in the eurozone will pick up by the end of this year due to falling oil prices and the depreciation of the local currency. Korea's third and final group of health professionals who were sent to Sierra Leone to help out in the global fight against Ebola are now safe and sound back on Korean soil. And while efforts have been pretty successful and a number of cases is falling fast in the worst hit countries, an international medical organization has slammed world powers for dragging their feet at the onset of the outbreak. Our Gonsoa has more. It's been roughly a year since the deadliest Ebola epidemic in history broke out in West Africa. Countries around the world, including Korea, have contributed to the effort to contain the virus. Korea sent medical teams to Sierra Leone, one of the three countries most affected by the virus. It was the first time the country dispatched medical teams to an epidemic of this size. A total of three teams of volunteer doctors and nurses embarked on roughly one-month missions after prior training sessions in England. All members returned home safe, though there was a close call when a rescue worker was pricked by a needle carrying a patient's blood. Tests revealed the worker did not contract the virus. Although the decreasing number of new Ebola patients has also reduced the need for international staff, the fight is not over yet. In Liberia, the first case in around three weeks has officials concerned. 42 days without an Ebola case would have declared the country virus-free. A leading charity group, Paris-based Doctors Without Borders, released a one-year anniversary report on Monday, saying the epidemic could have been contained much earlier. The report criticized the international community, including the World Health Organization, for its slow response. The crisis was declared three months after the first reports of Ebola outbreaks. The charity also blamed local governments for downplaying the situation and not sharing significant data with their organization, suggesting a better controlled crisis could have shrunk the death toll, which currently stands at over 10,000. Konsoa, Arirang News. Any good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in swimming, where Pak Taiwan has finally received the suspension after a hearing with FINA in Lausanne, Switzerland on Monday. Now, despite having his legal team ready at the hearing, he was still slapped with an 18th month man for the use of the testosterone shot in the And despite losing his six medals from the 2014 Incheon Asian Games, the good news is he's still able to participate in the 2016 Rio Summer Games, which will kick off in August of next year. His 18th month ban starts from September 3rd of last year to March 2nd of 2016, giving him roughly five months to prepare for the Summer Olympics. Now on a brighter note and over to the JTBC Founders Cup, which finished off as four days of the event. And by the end of the tournament, yet another Korean went home with a trophy. And this time it's the 19-year-old super rookie in Kim Hyo Ju who shot a 5 under 67 on the final day to finish off with 21 under par overall to beat out American Stacy Lewis by three strokes. Now the latest win gives her her second LPGA title of her career and the first title this season, becoming the fifth Korean in six LPGA Tour events to win a trophy this season. Now, spring is in the air, which means baseball's right around the corner as the 2015 KBO season kicks off this Saturday with 10 teams playing for the first time in the league's history. But on Monday, those 10 teams came together for a media day. 
And of course, with the Samsung Lions winning four consecutive Korean Series titles, the focus was on manager Lee jung Il, who believes it'll be tougher this season as he chose the SK Wyverns and the Nexon Heroes as the teams to beat. But of course, it's anybody's title to win as the league will see an increase in the number of games from 128 games to 144 games. And now over to the second round of the best of five KBL playoff series between the Incheon ET Land Elephants and the Wonju Dongbu Promi. Now both teams with one win each look to get a one game advantage after Monday night. So let's take a look at the highlights from Incheon. Now another low scoring game between the two sides here as Dongbu takes a slim 13-11 lead after the first quarter before both teams go into the halftime tied 27-27. And while E.T. Lang quickly changes the rhythm of the game thanks to captain Ricardo Powell and his 17 points, 13 rebounds, Tongbu shuts them down in the fourth quarter with their tight defense. Outscoring E.T. Lang 18-6 to take game three, 55-51, and are now one win away from their first trip to the championship series in three years. And meanwhile, over to the first round of the best of three playoff series in the men's V-League. Now, OK Savings Bank and Kepco Vicstorm faced off on Monday night with OK Savings Bank one win away from their trip to the championship series. And just like game one, both sides going back and forth the whole night as Kepco takes the first and fourth set while OK Savings Bank takes the second and third sets of the game. And with the series on the line, the decisive fit set an exciting one to say the least, but in the end, it's the sea monster Robert Landy Simone who leads the way for the OK Savings Bank, taking a final set for a 3 2 victory to advance to a championship series against the Samsung Waja Blue Fangs. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. I'm Lee ji here with your latest weather updates. It's cold this morning. The lows have kicked off on the freezing side again in some parts, including here in the capital. And that chillier air will be around this morning, but readings will rapidly rise to low teens, a marking slightly higher than yesterday. And sunny spells continue, and the air quality will remain at an average range throughout the day across the nation. But the dryness got worse now. Dry weather advisory has been upgraded to warning in the capital and many parts are also suffering from that dry weather so be extra careful with anything that could start a fire on that note let's take a closer look at the readings for today while the daytime high here in seoul and Gwangju will peak at 12 Daegu and busan will rise to 14 and 13 respectively now let's see how other regions are looking it looks like jeju island and Daejeon should see a high of 10 and 13 and Dokdo only makes it to six this afternoon Afternoon. Now, the temperatures have been quite up and down lately, but the spring colds will break tomorrow, and the later part of the week looks to be more promising. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's all we have for now. Plenty more stories are online and it's also worth checking out our smartphone application for all the latest news and all the other programmes we have here on Arirang TV. We'll be back with our next newscast at noon Korea time, Newsline at noon. Until then, goodbye.